All right, Chris, uh, very excited yeah. to have you. Thank you very much for uh, being here. So you're not only a terrific investor, GP at uh, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, but you're also incredibly thoughtful, not just about venture capital, uh, but also about technology in general. So there's a lot of smart investors out there, but there's very few that uh, produce the level of quality of thinking that uh, you've been you know, uh, doing for, for a long time. So I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with Chris's work. If, if not, um, you know, check him out on, a, on Medium. And uh, before that, there was a cdixon.org. cdixon.org, yeah, I stopped blogging there. But. Yes, uh, but this is truly, truly, really, really interesting. So, uh, and you, you formerly a New Yorker as well, right? So yeah, you've been yeah. At, I lived here a long time. Yeah. Yes, uh, so you, you, you... And I come back here a lot, so. Yes. And uh, so before Anderson Orwitz, you were a, an entrepreneur, right? I was an entrepreneur. I started two companies. Uh, the first was a security company called Site Advisor, which uh, sold to McAfee. And the second was a uh, machine learning company called Hunch, which I sold to eBay. You mean AI? Yeah, AI, yeah. It's like today yeah, and would we called it machine today learning. Would be now AI. it would be deep learning. You know. Yes. We sold it in 2011. I thought we were late to the AI <laughs> thing. And it turns out, you know, if you look at the kind of the, the history of it, 2012. In fact, I saw a... Um, an investment bank put out a report recently, and it was like AI acquisitions over the last decade, and we were like the very first one. And I thought I was, I of course thought I was, you know, I thought I was late. But, yeah. <laughs> very, very yeah. cool. And so you're back here from, yeah. from time to time. Um, you know, since we have a, a New York crowd, mm -hmm. any any thoughts on the evolution of New York yeah. and versus? I mean, I think it's, places. you know, it's been, uh, New York has evolved a ton since, uh, you know, I don't know, over the last two decades. It used to be only kind of ad tech, and now, you know, you have all sorts of, uh, you know, I think Mongo is based here, uh, you know, Greenhouse is a great company, um, uh, uh, you know, Blue Apron, a bunch of IPOs recently. So, and I think what happens is, is you, uh, is, is these things have to get kind of built out in stages. So you have, you know, you have entrepreneurs who create these companies and they become very successful. And then you have management teams and developers and other people who leave and start new waves of companies. So I think it's, I think it's on a really good trajectory. Yeah, the rinse um, and repeat cycle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very, uh, very good. So we uh, we're going to talk about uh, a bunch of uh, different things. We invest in all those area, all the areas I personally find fascinating. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, AI, R, VR, that type of things, and Great. also a fair amount of crypto, uh -huh. um, which uh, I guess you, you spend mm -hmm. most of your time in these days, and I think is ultimately incredibly relevant to the world of data. I mean, this, I think is yeah. largely reinventing actually what data means and yeah. how data is shared and distributed. Uh, but maybe let's start with, with um, actually let, let's start with another view. So you, you you had this great post a couple of years ago, I think, that was called "11 Reasons to Be Excited About the Future of Technology," yeah, yeah. where you had like this amazing um, you know overview of all the different um, yeah. areas, and I think you talked about self-driving vehicles, AR, VR, uh, clean energy, all the things. Uh, so it's been a couple of years now, yeah. and uh, I think we've all witnessed some ups and downs in the in the hype cycle around. All of those things. I guess. Are you as optimistic about this emerging? I am. World? I am. I think you know these things take time, right? So, like I remember with smartphones, hearing people talk about it for de you know a decade before the iPhone came out, and I don't know if people are old enough to remember. Like I had like a Sidekick and you know BlackBerry and Trio and all these other things, and they were like they were awesome, but they were just like not quite there yet to be to really kind of you know explode and go and and become you know where we are today with whatever it is three and a half billion smartphones. So. Um, I think we're in like when you, when you take areas like self-driving cars and VR and AR and all these other kinds of things. I think we're in that kind of period. I don't know when uh, these things will hit, but they will hit, and they will hit. You know that because they're just getting better. You know, kind of Moore's law writ large, which I think of as not just you know uh, packing more semiconductors on the on the chips, but just all the things that happen when there's a lot of investment in an area. So. Uh, you know, if you just look at VR as an example, uh, the, the price of a high-end VR headset has gone down, I think, like 80% over the last three years. Um, and you're going to see more and more devices come out. And you start to see this whole kind of ecosystem effect where, like, Qualcomm is building specialized ASICs that will solve a lot of the problems, things like this. And, and uh, you know, there's a ton of investment there, self-driving cars, obviously. I think it's a, the, the hard thing with these things is you don't know when. Like, a, a lot of these things have, um, you know, self-driving cars as an example, right? Like... They say it's all about the edge cases, um, what what happens when a dog jumps out and it's snowing and all these other kinds of things. So until you really have these things tested at scale, you don't really know kind of how um, how long it will take. Um, so it's somewhere between like two and ten years probably for all of these things, or one and ten years or something like this. But 
I mean, what's the alternative? That like it's you know 100 years from now and all we're using is smartphones and none of this stuff works? I, I don't think that's very plausible. And if you just look at the history of technology, it tends to go in these sort of 10 to 15 year cycles, right? So you had the mainframe computers, you had PCs, you had the internet, you had smartphones. Like we're due for another kind of wave, I think, in the, next, in the near future. Um, and I think the likely, you know, if you look at the last 10 years, the big mega trends were social, mobile, and cloud, right? Um, People, everyone knows that now. You know, at the time it was sort of debated. Um, I, I think the big ones now are what I would call new computing platforms, which is sort of just generally the idea that you're going to have computers embedded all over the place: IoT, wearables, you know, self-driving cars, drones, VR, AR, like all these things. You just, and it's just you can just it's just a straight you can just extrapolate down. Like the prices are getting lower and lower. You can get a five dollar you know Linux computer now with Wi-Fi. It's Wi-Fi enabled. That's going to go to a dollar. They're going to get smaller. They're going to get better. Entrepreneurs are going to think about clever ways to, to you know to do things with them. Big companies mm -hmm. are investing massively in them. Um, uh, so you know, so that's an obvious. Sure. AI. And then the, the, it dovetails with AI because a lot of these devices are powered by AI, yeah. and that's how they interface with the world. That's how you talk to your Alexa. That's how the car understands the environment, et cetera. And so, and and okay. the and the results in AI have been have been sort of shockingly. All right. Impressive. So let, let, yeah. let's talk about this. Let, let's uh, take some of these areas in in order. So you, you've you've been an active investor in yeah. AI. Uh, judging by the number of yeah. your companies that have a .ai, so you're like wind.ai, comma.ai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you know companies. Is, yeah, is yeah, it yeah. A company .ai, .ai, .io, .io, which is, uh, .io, which is, which is, which is new, whatever, new, yeah. .com. And, yeah. <laughs> so so um, you had uh, this company, wind.ai, uh, two or three years ago that was uh, mm. uh, founded by uh, some of my fellow Frenchies um, mm. that um, was a very promising company that had an early exit, yep. um, and I think at the time you had mentioned that uh, this was a concern about, from an investor standpoint, about investing in the space. Like yeah. all these companies got snapped up so quickly. Um, it, it seems like we are past that phase now. Do you think it's a better time to invest in AI, or there's too much noise? Or yeah, it's a really good question. So it's a, it's an interesting space. I mean, so you know, it's not a secret that AI is a big deal, right? And it's and it's the it's basically the main R and D line item at Facebook and Google and other places. They spend massive amounts of money. They pay huge salaries. Um, and so, and, and, and moreover, they've, uh, they've commoditized a lot of the infrastructure. So, you know, the, first of all, all of the algorithms are published, the, uh, you know, some of the best frameworks are free, like TensorFlow from Google. So, you know, historically in the venture world, like a new trend happens, maybe you invest in the infrastructure or something like, that's not really a thing you can do here. Plus, on the service side, they have the, their cloud platforms. They're sort of baking us all into the cloud platforms as, you know, frankly, kind of a, you know, just an adjacency, almost lost leader for the real business, which is selling storage and compute and everything else. And they're building their own chips and like the TPUs and everything else. So like it's really capital intensive to like compete against that. So that makes, that kind of rules out like a whole set of investments that you might have imagined making. Um, so, you know, for the most part, I think the, the way that I think you invest in it is sort of in it. it well, there's a couple things. Like, one, it could just be that AI ends up like mobile and it's just sort of an ingredient in everything, you know. So I imagine Raj and Daniel's companies use AI heavily and it's just sort of going to be a thing you expect in modern software. And that's why Bloomreach is better than Adobe, which I'm sure it is, um, uh, because, you know, he's modern and, and they're modern and they're using AI, et cetera, you know, that kind of thing. So, one, so, so like, one outcome is just a sort of this thing that's baked into everything. I think another outcome is it's very verticalized, as, as Raj was making that point. Um, so, for example, we have a bio fund where we made a lot of AI kind of related investments. Um, it's more than half of those companies in that fund involve sort of deep learning in some way. Um, and so it's, it's very much like a very, you know, specific way to apply that technology. Um, and, and, you know, in that case, it's nice because um, the traditional healthcare world is not, you know, is not really focused on AI. So if you kind of have this new wave of founders who are kind of, you know, they're both computer scientists and biologists or, you know, have, or, you know, have medical expertise um, and they can combine the two really effectively, that's a really interesting startup opportunity as an mm -hmm. example, right? Um, so what, what do you make yeah. of the, you know, amount of data questions so that's become the, you know, inevitable comment on any kind of uh, AI-related uh, panel by, yeah. by VCs or say, no, 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 you can't, like, you know, Google has all the data in the world. Um, do, do, you, do you worry about that? Uh, I think for some applications like speech, you know, uh, speech is going to be, I think, very tough for non, you know, I mean, the Google and Amazon with their, you know, with their and Apple with their phones and the and the, you know, the the uh, Alexas and things like that are going to have a massive amount of data. I mean, there's a lot of sort of technical questions as to like what, how much data do you need to be good enough? Um, you know, does it matter if you have 10 billion, you know, data points versus a billion or whatever? You know, and yeah. how, like. 
at what point do those curves kind of asymptote? Um, or can think, you create your own data, yeah. I guess, through? The yeah, and, then, and I think people don't really fully understand the answers to those questions in a lot of these domains. Um, and so that's one question. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it is, I think a key question over the next decade is, uh, is who, who, who kind of wins in AI, and I think that will probably come down to who has the best data, because the algorithms are you know, all published and out there, and the frameworks are out there, and so it's not really, that's, that's not really gonna be the differentiator. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like you mentioned WIT, like the theory with WIT, this was, I think 2013, maybe when we invested, um, and so sort of a little bit before like this giant wave, of, I mean, it was at the beginning of this wave of AI, and, and their theory was, it was a developer platform, uh, for, for, for NLP, for speech, and the theory was that as, as it made errors, the developers would fix the errors and the system would kind of prove, um, and so they had this kind of, they, you know, they had this theory as to how there would be kind of a net data network effect. Data network, yeah. Um, yes. I think you've written a few blog posts about that, um, yes. about that idea. Um, and so, and you're right, they just got, they got bought by Facebook they, as, as uh, part of their messenger strategy, so we didn't really get to see that mm -hmm. play out. But. So yeah, the super interesting uh, post that, uh, has been referenced in so many conversations I've had, um, you know, maybe two or three years ago, but the, what was it called, the, the maze of... Um, idea maze. The idea maze of, yeah. of data. Can, can you talk about this? It's basically something to help uh, people think about where the opportunities yeah. are and how to navigate them. Yeah, that's not, so it's not my, so it was my friend, just my friend Balaji, who came up with this kind of concept of idea, or, you know, maybe an older concept too, but he wrote about it. Um, uh, but the idea is just that that uh, that the journey of an entrepreneur is not it's not it's not like you just have an idea and then you go ex yeah, implement the idea. Instead, the the analogy he uses it's more like a maze where you're kind of exploring the maze, running experiments, running into you know monsters or treasures or whatever. Pick your <laughs> metaphor or whatever. Um, uh, and it's just sort of this ongoing process, right? And so like you hear this you hear this sometimes in the, in Silicon Valley people say ideas don't matter, but of course ideas do matter. But it's really that they matter as dynamic processes. Like ideas are really, like startup ideas are really sort of dynamic processes that you iterate over. And and great entrepreneurs are very good at. at they, they first of all they enter they enter with uh, you know intelligently. They go study the history. They study adjacent markets. They talk to customers. They do a whole bunch of things. And then they as they go they iterate and they and I'm sure you know um, you know you talk to most entrepreneurs and the original idea evolved over time. Um, and so it's just a nice, it's a nice metaphor. And I think of it as, you know, a lot of what we do, you know, when we meet with entrepreneurs is sort of walk through the idea maze with them, sort of understand how they think about it. Obviously, they haven't fully thought it through, you know, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. but, but hopefully they've, you know, you can kind of tell if somebody has, has, has deeply thought about it. And so... Um, yeah, as a quick aside on that, it's actually something, so that's not a, not a data conversation, but it's sort of amazing... Um, I mean, ultimately, what, what separates the people that uh, I, I think one truly wants to invest in versus others or people that have that deep clarity of thought. Yeah. And it's amazing how people, how much homework people have yeah. actually done. And Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, I, I, um, and, and you live and breathe it, you know, and, and you work, you know, when you're, I'm sure there's a lot of entrepreneurs here who know this, um, you, you know, you work constantly, you think about it constantly. I mean, I, I was like insufferable when I was an entrepreneur. I don't think anyone could spend time with me because it's all I did and, you know, and uh, it's actually, it was like embarrassing. You couldn't go to like, you know, dinner parties or whatever because it's like, I, I don't even read the newspaper. I don't know what you're talking about, you know, so, um, and so, uh, yeah, and so it's just sort of, and by the way, like the other thing I'll say is no, almost every startup I've ever seen and been involved with has hit rough spots, has hit sort of the walls in the maze, if you will. It, it just almost always happens. Sometimes from the outside, it doesn't look like that. It looks like this sort of magical overnight success, but internally, like it's it's very often the case. Yeah. And so, um, and that's that's one reason I think why founders have to have d deep domain expertise, and it's if it's in a technical field, technical knowledge, because they have to be able to change. The, it's not a straight line. You have to adapt. Mm -hmm. And the maze is sort of inter inter interdisciplinary. There's, it involves business and the domain you're in and the technology and sort of all the trade-offs you can make yep. across those areas. Well, there was some, some uh, so specifically on the on the AI maze, uh, there was some some very interesting concepts where, I mean, if I remember correctly, uh, part of the idea was that. Um, MLOAI is not going to get you to 100% uh, success. Yeah. Um, so you're going to be in an 80% or 90% world. So, so can, can you can you walk us through? Yeah, there's like an old joke, and it's not really funny, but it's a it's old joke in machine learning that it's machine learning is really good at partially solving any problem. So like, you can basically the idea. Yeah, that's no, not funny. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> that's I guess it passes for computer science jokes. So, um, but uh, the idea is though that you can sort of like you know you can download TensorFlow, download some data sets, and over the weekend probably come up with you know if you're a good programmer, come up with something that. Can do like 80% accuracy of whatever, let's say OCR or something, right? 
Um, but then the last 20% takes you, you know, a decade, if not a lifetime or something, right? Um, and, and, uh, and so a lot of the strategy around building an AI startup is figuring out how to get that 20%. And I think of it as like there's different ways to do it. Like one, one is just to sort of punt on it. In some ways, you can think of Google results. They give you 10 results, right? They're sort of, you know, like in an ideal world, they give you one result, but they give you 10 results because they'd let the, the, the human figure out the last 20%, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of having a fault-tolerant UI, I'd call it, or something, right? That's yep. one way to do it. Um, uh, you know, and no, that works for certain domains, yeah. but like other domains. Yeah, like self-driving cars, you can't do that, obviously. Yeah. You can't, you know, and so, that, so that's why Google. Did you out. mean pedestrian? Yeah, no, so that, that's why they're out. That's why they have to take so long, and that's yep. why they have to drive around so much, right? Because yep. that's that last 20%. Yeah. And then uh, also it depends on, I guess, what kind of problem you're trying to solve, right? Like you were saying, if it's a tenure problem, then you need to go work at Google or an institution. Yeah, it's hard for startups often to fund themselves beyond, uh, you know, like usually, you know, people raise money for a couple of years or something, and so um, some of these problems just require so much data and so much investment that they're almost beyond. Uh, you know, although that's maybe changed with these big, you know, venture firms like SoftBank and things who, you know, supply enough money that maybe you could still do that. So. Yeah, for the next yeah. twenty-five years. Um, so let, let, let's talk about the uh, AR and VR that that uh, you mentioned. So you you were an early investor in Oculus, uh -huh. uh, right? Which uh, turned out to be pretty good as an investment. Um, I, I uh, there's a couple of things, but first, what um, what do you think is needs to happen for this to get exciting again? I guess because it rewinds. Yeah, I think I think the down. devices aren't there yet. I think you need a two hundred dollar or some sort of consumer price point device, um, which has sort of the high end feature. So like, and that means like six degrees of freedom, head tracking. I don't know if people follow this stuff. Hand tracking. Um, you have to get rid of the cord. You know the the new Oculus thing that's going to come out next year. I think they've just they've just they've said about talked about it. Santa Cruz looks promising, but I don't know if it'll hit that price point. But that's generally how it works in consumer electronics. Is you need like you know you need that sort of iPhone like mm. kind of experience, um, and it's not quite there. I mean it's very there's a lot of stuff going on. Apple's doing stuff. You know, um, Google and Facebook, and so I think it's going to get there. Yep, and I guess content matters. Get some more water. Sorry. Like yeah, yeah, absolutely. Water. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, appreciate it. Um, um, and uh, content matters a lot as well, right? So well, that's so the other thing is, yeah, you, like, so like, I have, you know, an Oculus here and I use it, but like, it's basically like demo kind of level software right now and you don't have like AAA games being made and things like this. And if you talk to the game makers, they'll say it's just the user bit, you know, it's, there's like, you know, a couple million, I think, high-end devices now out there. There's tens of million low-end devices, but you really, I think, need the high-end experience. And so the, you know, like Fortnite doesn't have a, doesn't have a VR version right now. And so, um, so you need, so it's just sort of this chicken and egg problem where you need a certain number of devices out there before, but you know, but these, these things always, it always ends up happening, and I, you know, if you just look at the history of computing. And so um, it's just a matter of getting the right, the right device and then the right kind of content partners and then eventually, and then once you get that going, yeah, I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to be huge. And, I, and I'm, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I, I'm still very bullish on, I know it's sort of fashionable to be like AR, not VR. I think AR is very cool, but I think VR. Yeah, I, I mean, was going to ask, yes. I mean, I think VR, I don't know, I just think of it as like, you want it, do you want to go partially into the matrix or fully into the matrix? Yes. Like, I think people are going to want to go fully in the matrix, and it's just a very deep, immersive experience. It's, uh, um, so AR is a gateway to Yeah, no, AR is very interesting too, but it's, I think, probably more for like business context, so you're you know, uh, overlaying, uh, there's like these kind of cool demos where you can like overlay like the, you know, uh, architectural, like a building on the table and like talk about it and things like this. And so uh, for like video conferencing kind of stuff, like you could be here virtually like that, what's that movie, Kingsman or something? Yes, where they had, yes, yeah, yes. So that's the part I liked was the AR part. Yeah, yes, cool. very good, which you, which you had in your blog post. Yeah, yeah. so uh, um, I, I think it's all going to happen. I think it's just a matter of, uh, I just think it's a matter of time. I mean, the, the, uh, the amount of investment going in that space and just the, and the rate of improvement and everything else, it's, it's just, you can just kind of draw a line yeah. to it. And if you were an entrepreneur, you think that now would be a good time? Like, it's often at the bottom I think of the it, way, I think right? it could be. Yeah, I think yeah. this might be the right, I don't know. I mean, it's very hard to say exactly, but, but I think it's plausible. Yeah. I guess same question. Like, you know, I don't know. I mean, the flip side, like, if you kind of go back in the iPhone, so iPhone came out 2007, I believe, right, yeah. in the App Store in 2008. So what was the optimal time? It's probably it was probably 2009 and 10, frankly, where the if you look at when the most successful mobile companies were started. Yeah. Although I think those Uber. entrepreneurs were probably you know working on that stuff and ideating and things before that. Mm -hmm. um, but that but that was a magical kind of era there. You know that's when you had if you just go look at all the top apps, they were all created between 2009 and 11, basically. Yep. 
I guess same question for the Internet of Things, right? That was all the rage, uh, yeah. you know, two or three years ago. You, you still bullish on? on I that? am. I am. It's just like, like I mean, I think everyone here has probably used these devices and like the Apple Watch and everything else. They they just don't feel like they're they're quite there yet, right? They're not, yeah. uh, you know. And like, I, I love the Alexa and things, but what do you use it for? You probably use it for music and weather and like one or two other things. It's not quite, you know. It's not. Um, it just it just doesn't seem like it's quite there. I mean, they subsidize it heavily, and it's very inexpensive, and so it's gotten adoption. But I don't know how well that would do it uh, if they didn't have the business model to kind of subsidize it. But but um, but I don't know. I just think the devices aren't quite there. You know, mm -hmm. and you look at but you just look at the trajectory. Like the Apple Watch now has you know you know they, it's gotten better and better, and has the you know uh, is getting to the point where it's going to be kind of a standalone device. Mm -hmm. And is that is that a you know a business? Uh same thing with the RVR, I guess, uh, where, where startups can do... I think, like, if you look at the phone, at phones, like, there were a lot of great startups created the app layer. Yeah. Probably not. Pro it's probably harder at the device layer just because of the amount of capital required. Yeah. And the fact that um, all of the big tech companies are investing so heavily in it. Yeah. Yeah, but if you look at everything that happened in consumer IoT, that was all hardware, yeah. right? Like, everybody, uh, you know, became, a, like, a Shenzhen yeah. And they've been uh, really successful, like Ring, and there's been some other, you yeah. know. Oh, yeah, Ring, in which you're an investor, yeah. yes. Yeah, okay. Very, uh, very good. And I guess another area, just to uh, close on that, that, that whole, you know, com emerging competing platform um, uh, world is uh, drones. So you have a bunch of things there, right? You have a uh, your investor in Airware, Skydio, Zipline. Yep all super interesting companies in the space. So, you know, yet again, the, the sort of the same question, but I'm, I'm curious yeah. if there's any difference, right? It's like another one where like everybody's super excited two or three years ago and that seems to uh, yeah. you know, yeah. be taking I think, some time. Um, Is that regulation? Is that a... A lot of it's regulation in the US. It's uh, There's like beyond line of sight drones, for example, are not legal, um, which is a big issue for a lot of applications. I think a lot of the interesting applications are commercial applications and it's just the uh, adoption is just starting. It's, it's pretty, drones have been pretty successful in mining. Um, so people will fly over mining sites, and the reason they're and and they survey them, and then they create three D images, and they can check for safety and other kinds of things. Um, and that's actually a, a bunch of companies are having success there. I think they're successful there because those people are used to heavy equipment. They have hard hats. Like it's just like in a. Um, the, I think the drones aren't quite there yet. I think they need autonomy. That company Skydio you mentioned is a company that builds autonomous drones, um, so they don't they 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 don't have collisions right now. Yep. Um, um, <laughs> so that's yeah. very much an AI company, right? That's whole computer yeah, vision. Yeah, yeah. And, so, uh, and then like Zipline is a very cool company we're investors in, which is doing uh, medical supply delivery in Africa. So uh, somebody in a remote village can hit a button on a cell phone and a drone flies out, you know, hundreds of miles and drops like, you know, blood down and, and to somebody, who, you know, to doctors who need mm -hmm. it. And you think this is coming to the U.S. at, at some point? They're trying to. The regulation is the main issue. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's um, let's switch to crypto a little bit. Um, so you uh, have written some you know super interesting things. What one uh, one post uh, that um, I think I and many other people found you know very interesting was uh, about why decentralization matters, yeah. right? So. Um, you know, crypto is a is a topic. So it seems to be either you're, you're completely in it and you love it and you you know down the rabbit hole and, and all the things and you speak all the lingo, or if you're not in that, there's sort of another category of people that are ext extremely skeptical about yep. about the whole thing. Um, and you, you made the really interesting point around how decentralization was not about you know being a libertarian or anarchist or refusing censorship, but actually about something more profound. Yep. Yeah, so I think it's very analogous, you know, if you, to, op, to what's happened in open source software is what's I, I, so um, the way I, the way I think of crypto networks as I call them is is they are um, digital services, and that's I mean that in the broadest sense of any kind of digital service that are owned and operated by communities as opposed to being on our, owned and operated by companies, um, and it's very analogous to what happened to software for the last twenty years. So if you look at um, software, you know, in the nineties and the eight, so. The open source software movement began in the 80s with Richard Stallman and the free software movement. It was a political movement um, that kind of morphed into a tech movement. And um, um, the uh, and it was dismissed in the 90s as sort of this, you know, kind of radical new way to build software. But it turned out it was a better way to build software. Um, and Linux is now the dominant operating system in the world. Like, open source software has won. Like, it's by far the dominant. Your Android phone has Linux. Like, the iPhone is stacked with Linux. Every data center you talk to is Linux. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, anyway, so what, but then, and so what happened is tech companies then moved up the stack into services, and so Microsoft's a services company, Adobe, you know, obviously Google and Facebook are, and now um, 
developers have figured out this way to create services, which are sort of crypto networks that are owned and operated by communities. Um, and those services can be, they can be Bitcoin or something like that, where it's a, it's a ledger for money and it has these various features uh, you know, around uh, what you can do with that. But there's a, like Ethereum is a very interesting uh, network, which uh, you can build sort of any arbitrary smart contract and co it's a full programming language and you can write all sorts of interesting stuff. And there's just a ton of interesting, st you know, I'm meeting with entrepreneurs every day who are building interesting stuff on mm. that. Um, and many of it has nothing to do with financial applications. Okay. Sorry, I'm really parched. And, and, and um, so you were saying that the one issue is centralization. Uh, so if you look at you know, Facebook and Google, yeah. and they, bought, they brought amazing software and products to um, the world. Uh, but uh, you were saying that at some point, what feels like uh, yeah. uh, you know, a win-win for everyone ends up being a zero-sum game. Yeah, so, I mean, you see this with, like, what, what tends to happen with these big platforms is they start off being uh, very open to kind of third parties to, to, to startups. Like, if you look at Facebook early on, they, they embraced Zynga and they embraced media companies and things like this. And then as they got bigger, um, they started to fight against them. Um, and they started to sort of turn off, you know, their access and do other kinds of things. Um, yeah, well, Twitter, I guess. Yeah, I guess Twitter is a great example where they had this huge developer ecosystem and then they kind of killed it off. Um, and so, you know, and so entrepreneurs have learned this, VCs have learned this, this sort of this idea of platform risk. I think Raj has talked about it, um, which is, you know, you have to be really careful building on another platform um, because they can take that, they can take, you know, everything away. Um, and so, you know, what was so beautiful about the first year of the web was the, they were open protocols like, you know, HTTP and SMTP, email and web browsing. And so you could build on those protocols if you were Larry Page or Mark Zuckerberg and know that you could, no matter how big your business got, the protocols wouldn't take your business away. And that means you could invest in it. Um, and, and I think we've kind of lost, we're, we're at risk of losing that now because these centralized platforms have become so powerful um, that it's very hard to build on top of them and, and, and have any assurance that the rules of the game won't change later on. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that um, decentralized uh, uh, whether they be networks or protocols or, or whatever, you, what have you, um, are very important for, for sort of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, I think it's kind of like analogous to, you know, the way a city works is that you have, you know, you have public parks and you have public roads and then you have maybe an entrepreneur building a restaurant who, who knows that, uh, you know, he or she can, 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 can depend on the fact that the roads are public and the foot traffic is public. Um, and the rules aren't going to change, right? And so there's sort of, I think there's sort of a natural healthy balance which we had in the first year of the web between kind of the public infrastructure and the private infrastructure. And if you, and if you look at it now, so much of the infrastructure is controlled by private companies that I think, I think it's, you know, it's wonderful. We have, um, you know, three and a half billion people with smartphones. You can get a $15 Android phone now. You can access, you know, Wikipedia and all this other amazing information. Um, you know, a lot of it, Google's a miracle, like the fact that you can type in any word. I mean, it's like you go read science fiction and nobody ever describes some service like it would have sounded like the most ridiculous, mm -hmm. fantastical yes. thing in the world to say you can type any word and you get like billion. All these people create all these things and like it's all free and everything else. Um, and so, you know, so there's a lot of great things. I don't want to uh, sound negative there, but I think at the, I think it, it came somewhat at the expense of. Uh, of, of having kind of open protocols and networks upon which entrepreneurs can build. And so I think there's, I think there's a healthy balance and the pendulum has swung too far and I think it's swinging back. Okay, so that's why decentralization should win. I guess the next question is, yeah. how does it, how does I, it I win? I think the way, it, the, so ultimately the way you win in technology is you build, in particularly software in services, you build better software and services. Um, how that happens here is they attract the best developers. That's how Linux won. So why did Linux beat you know everything else? Because it attracted the best developers, right? Because it was open and they could they could build on it. It has better security. Like you could, the fact that anyone can audit the code gives it better security. The fact that anyone can go and contribute to it makes it integrate with other devices better, right? Like it's this huge consortium, effectively consortium. You know, very interestingly, like the top contributor to uh, uh, Linux is is uh, employees at Intel. Right, so it's not as nearly as sort of you know this kind of commune kind of idea that people think it is. I mean, there are these enthusiasts, but a lot of it is our you know corporate interest. It's almost like a consortium. Like Intel people contribute to it because it's very important to them that they have an adjacent operating system to their chipset that is open, right? Um, and so you, you got this. So you basically because it was open and because everyone kind of worked together, you got better software. And the same idea happens with these crypto networks where you know you have all these people building on Ethereum and they all want to see Ethereum succeed. And probably a lot of them, by the way, own Ethereum tokens. Um, they, they don't worry about the code, you know, the, the, the kind of the rules are baked into the code, the, the rules can't change, they know they can invest in it, they're all aligned, they're all like, and, and like I'm seeing it now, I, the waves of talent that I'm seeing, you know, it's, 
it's, it's, it's becoming a mass exodus, I'd say, uh, from places like, I mean, I, I see this all the time where, um, I have three of these meetings a week where it's team coming out of Google or Facebook or someplace like that, um, and they say, you know, I grew up interested in computers, I moved out to the valley to, you know, to, to build a startup or to do something innovative, and, and what do you actually do at, at Google and Facebook, right? You're, for the most part, you know, outside of a very small group of people, you're probably working on ad targeting, back-end infrastructure, whatever, like some other, you know, that's not, most people are not working on new product development, and a lot of them are disillusioned with that, and they, and then they start hacking on, like, Ethereum on the weekend, and I hear this all the time, and this is, this feels exciting and new and innovative, it's the frontier, it's the, you know, it's the, this is, this has always been the, this the kind of motivator for the new waves of entrepreneurs is to work on the frontier, mm -hmm. um, and this is this is it has attracted a lot of great people, which makes me the most the most optimistic. The reason I'm most optimistic is the talent is, and that's always to me that's all, my my the thing that's worked for me as an investor is to not to to, to not try to outsmart uh, really smart developers. Just sort of let them show me where to go and follow them. Yeah. Um, and then here the signal is is as strong as I've ever seen it. Yeah. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right, the two large extent. Because yeah. so the, the, the thing is, uh, all, all of this, and I think you used that term, like looks so half-baked, right, compared yeah. to any product that does come out of Facebook or Google. It's like all shiny and new and that like, works. It's like Wikipedia in 2001 or something, right? You look back then and they, there was, you know, they, had a, they had a centralized competitor in Carta, um, which was made by Microsoft. And if you go back to 2001 when Wikipedia was started and Carta was way better and it had pictures and all this other stuff, and Wikipedia was just an open thing, it was decentralized. And, but, and, and it had a two-step go-to-market, right? It first had to attract the contributors, and then the contributors had to create better content, right? But, you know, and so it started off worse, but if you kind of look at the curves of quality, and Carta kind of went up, you know, linearly as they hired more people, and Wikipedia went up like this because of the contributors, right? And today, and Carta shut down in 2009, and Wikipedia is, you know, people, you talk to kids today, and they just think it's like, oh, it's always existed, and it's this magical thing. You can type any Abraham Lincoln and whatever and read this whole thing. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? Yep. Um, so, um, so what needs to happen? At the, it's actually funny, you know, yeah. it, it's funny to go back. I tell people, I actually wrote a blog post about this too. Uh, if you go back to, it was pre-2007, it was really, Wikipedia was really controversial. It got banned in a bunch of college campuses. There was a Nature article that came out in 2007, um, which, where uh, uh, some researchers showed that it was actually as accurate as Encyclopedia Britannica, and it was like this big shocking revelation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great, there's a great book, it's called like Everything is Bad for You, I think, or something. It's, uh, it's, it goes through the history of all technology, basically every technology in history, including the novel, chess, I'm not kidding, um, you know, bicycles, cars, every one of them had this like five to ten year period where everyone said it's like destroying the youth, it's <laughs> only for criminals, it's like, like literally there's this, there's this, in this book there's this part where they're like from the newspaper, it's like these kids, they stare at the chessboard like they're zombies, and like it's just because it's new, and it's new and different, you know. Um, uh, the people, the way they talk about Bitcoin today is like, oh, it's only for criminals, isn't that? But by the way, uh, so my partner's Mark, Mark Andreessen, he, you know, he worked on Netscape, and so Netscape created SSL in the 90s, which is the, you know, the encryption protocol of the internet. Um, they were like hauled in front of, you know, regulators and things, because the, the, the thought at the time was who would want to encrypt it except for criminals? Like, why would you want to encrypt things, right? Like, literally, this was, a, this was, a, this was the debate in the 90s over encryption. And they were saying, you want to encrypt it because you want to do, you know, you want to buy stuff and you want to like do private transactions. It sounds funny today, but uh, I think it will sound just as funny, the stuff people say about, about, you know, cryptocurrency and like, wow, you know, we're telling these stories 20 years from now. We're like, yeah, they said it was all just this and that. And of course, you know, anyways, so I think it's following the same kind of predictable life cycle. Fascinating. And I guess what one key aspect of um, this this whole paradigm is um, is tokens and mm -hmm. how they help with building networks and addressing cold yeah. start problems and that type of things. Yeah, I mean one one of the geniuses thing. If you haven't read the Bitcoin paper, I recommend it. It's like nine pages, I think. Um, it's uh, one of the genius things about it, right? Is so like how do you how do you get a community operated service and like why why. Um, like, why does Wikipedia have to be a nonprofit that asks for money and things like this? Because you need some way to pay for the servers and the whole kind of operating expenses of the, of the business. And so one of the genius things of Bitcoin is, well, how do you pay for the service? You pay with Bitcoin. So this is this circular idea, which is well, we're going to create a service that has value and we're going to create some scarce digital resource in that service. And then we're going we're gonna to fund the service through that scarce digital resource. So, so it was circular, but it worked. And it's worked many times since. Um, and so I, I, think that I, I think the idea of trying to build like a blockchain system without a cryptocurrency associated with it, you're losing this essential aspect, which is this funding model essentially, um, which funds both the operation of the network, but also the development, the developers who, who work on it. So what you know, often happens is, is uh, you know, people like us will fund them and then in exchange for like coins or tokens and then they have money to build the software. And it also, 
funds the kind of third party developers. And it also, yeah, you mentioned the bootstrap problem. Um, you can, what, what, you know, what, uh, so the, the, one of the hardest problems of creating a network effect business is in, the, is in the early phases, there are network effects, right? And so, so many um, startups die in what we call the bootstrap phase. If you just look at just empirically the number of market, I'm sure you've invested in marketplace businesses and like 99% probably of network effect businesses die before they kind of get to network effects, to real network effects. Um, and so one of the other clever things that Bitcoin did and a lot of these other crypto networks do is they basically incentivize the early users very heavily to get over that bootstrap phase. And so that's another really interesting innovation there. Mm -hmm. So I guess, so it sounds like we are in the infrastructure building part of the crypto. Uh, is that, is that, is I that so. correct? I think so, I think so, yeah. I mean, well, there are some interesting, you know, I mean, I, I think like, for example, uh, the, yes, I think so. And I, but there's a whole bunch of people building interesting applications now yeah. as well. So I think that will. I think that I, I hope and I expect over the next year or two we'll see some really interesting applications. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this in a, just in a quick second. So on the infrastructure uh, phase, what, what needs to happen? Is that is that a scalability problem? Is that, there's a scalability uh, problem. So a lot of these networks just don't scale very well. Like Ethereum, you know, can handle 1.2 million transactions a day, which is not web scale. Um, I think there's other things like we've invested in a number of things we call stable coin. They're called stable coins, yep. which are basically coins that are that are pegged to, to something like the U.S. dollar, which just is a much better user experience to use something that's that's you know like a dollar, like it's a virtual dollar as opposed to a Bitcoin that's highly volatile. For example, oh, thank you. Um, do, you do you want to explain yeah. how that so uh, basis yeah. in particular, like how, how yeah. that how that works? Uh, there's different types of stable. Coins. I mean, you really want to be <laughs> happy to if you guys want to. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't know. It's deep in the weeds. But uh, there's different types of stable coins. There's, there's fully collateralized stable coins. There's one called Tether. That's sort of this this one in uh, this company Bitfinex has. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other people working on that, where you basically literally have a dollar in the bank for every dollar kind of traded, and that that obviously will work. It's just hard to scale. And then there's these sort of semi-collateralized things, so Basis and Maker, we're both investors in both of those, which have these, basically they have these systems where it's like kind of two coins, and one coin tries to kind of regulate the price of the other. Maker's been out. Uh, it's been live for a few months, and it's been quite stable, and it's working so far. Um, there's, all, there's questions as to whether they can survive in kind of black swan financial events and things. Yep, yep. And then maybe uh, talking about DApps, uh, decentralized apps that you mentioned. Yeah. So that, that's the number one question that everybody that doesn't spend you know too much time in the space asks: like, what, what is this thing for? Uh, what, yeah. what? So you're the investor in uh, Open Bazaar, which is a decentralized uh, marketplace, yeah. and also in uh, Crypto Kitties. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, I think is a super interesting investment. So let, let's. Uh, I guess let's talk about DApps, but like maybe double clicking on, on CryptoKitties, you had this um, you know post that again is referenced very often, which is that every great a lot of great innovations start looking like a toy. Yep. Um, do, do you want to? Well, so so CryptoKitties, yep. uh, this is a, come. I know it's uh, people think it's you know it's funny it's CryptoKitties, but uh, <laughs> um, they, so they the, that team there kind of helped pioneer this area that are called non fungible tokens, which are basically like digital items that are that where you can prove that you own the item, um, and so. Um, you may know that the by far the dominant business model for video games today is is virtual goods. So like League of Legends, two and a half billion in revenue last year, selling co literally cosmetic items only. Like these are not even goods that make you better. Fortnite, people probably know. Um, I think they they announced they made three hundred million last month. You selling? They mostly sell emotes, which are dance moves, like literally. So like. You know, so if you think CryptoKitties is silly, like look at the real world. Look what's actually happening and what the actual business model. I mean, I'm just saying. Like, so, anyways, uh, but the, but those goods are they're they're you're really kind of renting those goods from the service. You don't really own them. You can't take them and do other things with them. You can't take them across services. You can't trade them. And so there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of really interesting game entrepreneurs now, including the CryptoKitties team, who are who are, who are excited by this new model of virtual goods, where the user can actually own the goods can trade the goods, can bring them across, have interoperability across games. And so that that's kind of the area yep. of sort of exploring that idea. So what, what does that look like long term, something like crypto, crypto kitties? You go into um, crypto dogs? Crypto. I, I think, for example, like, uh, um, well, I won't speak specifically about them, but I'll speak about why I think the area is interesting. Um, uh, I, I, I think that uh, what, something I believe is that um, uh, the internet should be uh, better for creative people uh, as a business uh, for for the business models of creative people than it currently is. That there are that are there are undiscovered business models, for example, for musicians. Um, and so I think one very interesting application of of which you're going to see, I think, in the near future, is uh, 
Um, so if you look at musicians today, they make, they make very little money on streaming. They make most of their money on offline merchandise and shows, and that's because that's where the scarcity is. And so I think you're going to see musicians who now make money by selling digital virtual goods, as an example, which mm. is not a model today, and that's like a very interesting new model, as an just example. Which is and, and so you know, and so you can say like, okay, it's just, is it just silly in games? Uh, you know, um, on the flip side, look, if it's if it's something that can help fund creative people like musicians and writers and you know and game makers and a whole bunch of other things, that's awesome, right? Yep. Um, and if you look, uh, I have another blog post about this. If you're interested, in it. It, it it didn't get that widely read, but it was. Uh, um, it was about how I, I believe that the kind of the frontier of media is is happening in video games, um, and and uh, particularly like Steam on the PC. It's just a very creative environment where there's like crowdfunding and virtual goods and modding and all these other kinds of things that go on. Which um, and and I think in video games it's been it's been very creative because there's not much IP, there's not much copyright kind of. Uh, so with music, you know, you have 70 year copyrights. Like it's just like the 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 record companies are effectively law firms at this point. Um, they just don't allow, like remember Turntable FM, it was a really cool service, yep. um, and they just don't allow that stuff. So they don't allow experimentation, right? Whereas the video game world, they just sort of have a different attitude. They, they, they you know, it's very creative and people are just coming up with new ideas and they just sort of assume you'll have experimentation. Like, you know, Twitch is a good example where, you know, I don't think you'd see that in other, in other areas of media where you could just watch someone play and not ever pay. You know, Nintendo, which is sort of a conventional video game company, they resisted Twitch for a long time, and they eventually gave in because they realized it's, uh, you know, it's better to have that marketing than it is to kind of, um, you know, uh, I don't know, be defensive about it. Um, and so, anyway, so I think like for NF non-fungible tokens, that uh, that you know, I think for example, it could be a very interesting business model for a lot of creative people. Mm -hmm. um, and just as, as a quick uh, detour, do you, do you want to talk about that um, that that that? Post the next great innovation will look like a toy. I think that for anybody that's an entrepreneur, sure, I think it's a yeah, super it's a, it's a concept. It, 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 I mean, it's really, it's not. I mean, I, I guess that was my blog post. The idea really comes from Clay Christensen, um, and uh, the idea is uh, is essentially that, um, like, if you go back, that essentially, um, a lot of technologies start off kind of half baked but they get better at a, at a rate that's sort of faster than kind of people need the technology to work. So human demand is sort of a straight line and the technology is kind of coming up on a curve. And so like I remember Skype as an example, um, you know, when it started off, I actually worked at a VC firm that was a junior person at a VC firm that invested in it. And in our memo, like the key risk was there weren't microphones and computers at the time, really, literally, that was like the key risk because that you know, it wasn't clear they were going to be. Also, it dropped calls a lot. The quality wasn't that great. You know, if you looked at the time, all the business world was talking about VoIP and like other kinds of things and these sort of high-end experiences. But what obviously happens, it got better and better and computers got mics and bandwidth got better and all these other things. And then, you know, and then eventually they had smartphones. And then of course now, you know, that's sort of the way things work. So... Um, there, there's just sort of you know tons of examples of this in the you know the telephone the first uh, Clay Christensen talks about this the first telephone it only went like a mile and the sound quality wasn't good and at the time the dominant uh, business model for te telecom you know for Western Union was uh, was for railroad operators to talk across the country and they didn't see the application they passed on buying the patent for a very low price you know but they just it was you know it, you, if you follow the trajectory these things would get better and as they got better you know new use cases would evolve and this kind of flywheel would kick in and Mm -hmm. um, and so, it doesn't mean everything looks like a toy. Is is you know some of these things just end up being toys and they don't get better. But but I think if you look at the underlying process, and if the underlying process is one where it's growing exponentially and getting better, um, it's it's something that you should sort of take a hard look at. Um, and I think that process can be things like like we we're talking about VR. It can be kind of Moore's law type things where things are just getting better and better. Or it can be I think the thing I like to focus on is what I call kind of developer energy. Like all the developers are working on it. So like I just wouldn't want like if you want to bet against Ethereum as an example like you're effectively betting against you know I don't know like a re lot of really really smart engineers and I just don't, I think it's a you know I, yeah. I'll take the other side of the bet I don't know <laughs> I guess it's sort of the way I think about it. Um, now, what do you what do you make of the noise uh, in in crypto? So like all the ICOs and like all the all the craziness is that is that actually a real danger to the space? You think or uh, yeah yeah I don't I mean I don't I don't think the um, I mean look the, you know it's anything that involves sort of large amounts of money attracts you know it's it's just it attracts there are people that are attracted to it who shouldn't be in doing it and there's scams and things like this um, and. Uh, and a lot of that, though, I think has been the regulators have, have shut a lot of that down, and that's good. Um, so I, I do think it's a risk, though. I think, um, you know, I think it's very important that there be sensible regulation that stops those scams but allows for innovation. So I think that's a key thing that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. 
And what would you what what kind of regulation do you do you think is is that is that you know ACC qualifying tokens as securities is that I guess New York yeah. had the bit license uh, thing which all the you know Kraken guys uh, and many yeah. others hated. Meanwhile, I guess Wyoming is trying to uh, to go rogue and uh, create their own legislation. Yeah. I mean, is that it, it's very complicated. There are many organiz many regulatory bodies who have you know who intersect with this. So you know FinCEN, IRS, SEC, CFTC. Um, and uh, it's going to take a while to kind of figure out, um, but you know, I guess I'm optimistic about it. Yeah. Um, but what, any any preference if you if you could influence the regulators, as I'm sure you can. Uh, any preference about where that should go, or any of that stuff? Yeah. You know, um, well, I think I mean, look, I think I think the key the key concepts, as I understand them, you know, I, I don't know, I, I sh I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to get too uh, into the details there, but, but um, I think the key, the key concept is you have enough room for entrepreneurs to build, you know, like these digital services done in the proper way, um, but also, you know, protections to make sure that um, information is symmetric, that someone, someone who's not in Silicon Valley can make an inform if they decide to buy something for investment purposes, can make uh, you know an informed decision. So that's where that's where a lot of the regulatory framework. So, for example, there's an important distinction between securities and commodities. Um, and uh, you know, regulators have said that Bitcoin is a commodity, which essentially essentially the idea there is there's no information that like I have about Bitcoin that would give me some advantage in buying Bitcoin over anyone else. Anything I know is from the internet. It doesn't. It's a fully decentralized protocol. Everything's open. Um, and so I think that some framework where we sort of understand kind of balance. Um, you know the, the 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 protections for kind of Main Street investors with enough room for people to innovate. And how do you invest as a as a VC uh, in in the space, right? Because this whole thing is evolving quite quickly, and I. I know you're definitely an yeah. investor in, as an equity investor, standard VC investor, but I think you're also an investor in, uh, in Polychain, which is a hedge fund yep. uh, for cryptos. And uh, I, I think I've read that you guys have made some direct investments in tokens. Like, it's, yep. How do you think about, I guess, all of this? How you yeah, so originally, so we invested in, like, for example, Coinbase f over five years ago now. Um, uh, and that was, of course, a traditional kind of, you know, it's a regular company. We're buying equity. You know, they're obviously in the crypto space, but but that was sort of a regular, you know, kind of C-Corp. Um, we've since, about a year and a half ago, kind of crossed over to doing also direct investment in coins and tokens. Um, and I think that's... I how, think, do you, how do you evaluate that? Is that based on the quality of the project? You like the yeah, white it's paper? it's just like all venture capital. It's... Uh, you know, great, great technical teams with big ideas. You know, executing well. Like it's the same. It's exactly the same kind of uh, uh, sort of analysis you would do in any kind of. It's obviously a different domain and uh, different go to market and a whole bunch of other different things. But but it's very similar. I think mm. it's just the, the you know the financial instrument is a different. Yeah. Different. It's hopefully more liquid yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, so do you, do you, a little bit to that point, do you think that um, ICOs actually can or will disrupt venture capital? I mean, is that uh, is there a world where in a few years ICO is just like the way anybody raises money because the whole world has gone to decentralized apps? Um, well, I think you know it, it, it's to some extent it's it's happened a little. I mean, it ha it's happened to some extent in the sense that. Um, I remember when Bitcoin was sort of starting off in 2013 and 14, all the entrepreneurs would come to VCs to raise money around Bitcoin startups. And then when Ethereum started with the, with the you know the kind of crowdfunding that they that's that's available on Ethereum, that was less so. Um, um, I think it's possible. I think it might be. You know, I think look, I think if you can do it in a sensible way that protects investors, I think it would probably be a good thing to have. Um, you know, I mean, look, I think a lot of these things, these two, like these, the, like the the, the you know. If you're a, you know, the way that the regulation, regulations work, right, is you have to be an accredited investor, which is somebody with at least a million dollars net worth, and there's a couple other criteria. Um, um, should a, you know, should an expert programmer be able to invest in a programming project? Like, maybe, I don't know, you know, like, should there be a different way to kind of decide on accreditation? If you're an expert in a field, why, why shouldn't you be able to, you know, I, I mean, for example, like, that's something you could imagine. Um, uh, but... Uh, I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting to see. A lot of it will just will frankly be the will be a regulatory question and sort of how to balance because uh, uh, you do need investor protections, um, uh, but but also how do you kind of keep it open? So great. All right. So maybe one last question from me, and then I'll open it up to 
uh, people. So maybe like tying it all together. Uh, so we talked about AI, IoT, and crypto. Do, do all the things ultimately work together? I Is think so. If you look at mobile social cloud last 10 years, right, they all ended up intersecting. So, um, you know, mobile... Uh, reinforced, you know, uh, Facebook is as big as it is because of mobile, right? Um, because that dramatically increased the, the number of internet users, the time they spent online, everything else, right? In turn, social helped mobile in that social, like Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, is sort of a, you know, is an app that people like, they, they, they love and they use and drove demand for mobile phones. And then cloud was an architecture that, that allowed, you know, those companies to support uh, billions of users um, and then in turn then offer those cloud services out to enterprises as we've seen. Um, mm -hmm. So they all kind of intersected and, and, the, and you know, and like the most successful startups, for example, like the, the, the new social companies in, the, in this post-mobile were kind of mobile first, right? So I think, I think it's very likely in the future you'll see a similar thing where like these kind of mega trends will all intersect. Um, how exactly it happens is very hard to say, but. Mm. Very cool. Wonderful uh, questions. Or should I pick or you? Or, okay. Yes. Sorry, I don't, so you're saying uh, uh, just how do you monetize the data, or? Yeah. 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 Yeah, but Google doesn't sell, they don't, I mean, contrary to a lot of the news stuff, like Google and Facebook don't actually sell data, right? They sell, they sell services that use the data, right? And so I think that's the model that's worked in tech, and it's likely the model I think that would work generally is you don't actually literally sell the data, and there's all sorts of data privacy issues and things around selling data. So I think the right model is to not sell it, but you know, to, to use it in an intelligent way that makes your products better. I don't know, but that's the tech model at least, I don't know, I mean. Oh, okay, sir. Um, you said earlier in your remarks that the, the company that owns AI will likely be the player that has the best data. Um, but there are a lot of players outside of Facebook, Amazon, Google that have these large data assets that they're not monetizing or yeah. they're not growing. But at the same time, these companies have trouble attracting the talent that they need to monetize their data yeah. assets. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how these more community, more paid well, I think it's an entrepreneurial opportunity, right? Is is uh, it's, it's it's not going to be the case that every company is going to hire AI a ton of AI experts, right? But what they can do is they can buy products that are built by AI experts that help them with those problems. So I think you're you know you're already seeing a whole way. We have, a, for example, a company called Databricks, which is uh, built around Spark, which is essentially you know they are the some of the world leading experts in you know kind of big data analytics management out of Berkeley. And they build this product, and then the product is used by people who, who you know, don't have that level of, you know, who are very knowledgeable, but they're not, you know, they're not the, the you know, the AI pioneers. Um, so I think that's probably a very, like, you know, it's probably a business opportunity, frankly, to create a t tech products that, that help those companies unlock the, the value of that data. I don't know. Do I, or you, oh, oh, okay. Really, really great. Okay, great, thanks. Um, since many of us do work for startups here, at AI Group, on the other side, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the interactions you're having with entrepreneurs and AWS and AI Group, right? So you're talking you know, about open protocols in that first year, but yeah. like, everybody's able to build on that. Now we've got, basically, you have two Goliaths out there in AWS family, and you're building your platforms literally you 
you know, we were all just working on our local machines, they all platform dependency, so we can yeah. scale to hundreds of nodes. I think a lot of it depends on where you are in the stack, right? If you're building applications, you're probably, you know, they can be a partner where you can use their services, their their cloud services, and you know, and maybe, and and maybe that works out just fine. If you're building infrastructure, which could be, you know, subsumed by them, that's a different question, right? Um, is, that, is that which which one are you referring to? Yeah. I don't do I don't invest in those areas, so I'll just caveat with that. But uh, so I'm not an expert. Um, but you know, I think like I think that I think if you have um, uh, we do have you know companies that that work in those areas, and I think um, the the you know the key is to you just you need you just really need like an order of magnitude kind of better technology and product. Like it just really raises the bar, right? Because it's essentially an old problem in startups, which is you're competing against bundlers, right? It's like people compete against Microsoft, you know, with Office or something, right? If they bundle, you know, they can bundle like it's Quicken versus Microsoft money, right? So they can bundle one that's pretty good. Maybe it's not quite as good as Quicken, but it's good enough. Um, so it's, it's essentially a bundling problem, right? And the way, you know, how did, how did Quicken fight it off? They just, they just had an amazing product. They had an obsessive customer focus. They, you know, did all sorts of things. And so there, there is a way to do it. It does, it does, though, mean you have to be much more differentiated and... Um, it depends on the sector too. If you're selling to enterprises, as an example, there tends to be, you know, um, uh, at the application layer, there tends to be kind of more, you know, once th there's like they, they tend to be very loyal customers if you if you treat them well and things. So I, it it varies, but but uh, I think yeah, I think it does make it harder. Um, so I don't know. Thank you. Um, have you made any bad risks in AI in your I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't mind sharing, can you like what is the reason that caused that? Well, I don't want to say anything bad about any start. I'll talk about my own startup, which is because uh, I'll insult myself. Um, uh, you know, it's funny. I if you asked, so I had an AI startup my own, and. Um, if you asked me like five years ago, I would have I would have given you a whole list of things I think we could have done better, and you know we had a pretty it was it was pretty good in the end, but like it wasn't what I was hoping for. Um, uh, but I have to say now I kind of just think we were too early because um, it was right before like a lot of the stuff we were working on um, it worked really well, but it didn't work as well as it would work to, it would work a lot better today, frankly, with deep neural networks and all the other kind of breakthroughs that have happened, and so that this just goes to the. Yeah, you know, that's right, that's right. And so, uh, uh, you know, so much of this, of startups is timing. And uh, I don't know, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I don't know, I mean, I, the, the ones, I, that, that's, that's probably the best example I can give, but yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. As you know, there's a ton of, if you follow the space, there's a ton of discussion of governance, and there's a whole bunch of different approaches to it, including what's called on-chain governance, which is having kind of in-the-protocol governance, and then off-chain, which is sort of just the human side of it. Um, 
Um, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to just sort of best practices that we've learned in the startup world. So, you know, in the financial side, having, you know, if you have a team that's working on it, have vesting and have all sorts of other kinds of things, have, uh, you know, kind of a cohesive team with a, with a good management team and things like this. Um, but, you know, you're right, there's a lot of kind of jumping around. It also is what makes the space so dynamic, like the open source world, where um, there's so much knowledge sharing, everything's open. It just makes the kind of the iteration speed much faster. So I think it's, you know, in some ways, it's, it's sort of like this Darwinian process. I think over time, I think we're in an early phase, and over time, you'll start to see kind of like some of the more like successful infrastructure projects kind of uh, separate themselves from the others, and it will become clear that it's better to work on whatever that project is versus start your own. But it's kind of like, you know, you look at all the tech cycles, like in the 90s, everyone had to have, to have their own startup, and then eventually people said, hey, maybe it's better to go work at Google or something, right? So I think it's kind of the same, I, I think of it as sort of the same process, right? Um, and, and we're just in this kind of Cambrian explosion phase where all this experimentation is happening, which, This is one here. We'll, we'll take like two or three more. Um, yeah, so with respect to the standards that are out there, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, do you think that um, that they've already won, or are, are standards like EOS and the hash rate going to really be won? This is a really, this is a, I didn't, uh, this is a very crypto uh, savvy audience. Um, uh, it's a good question. I, I think well, it's, New York, uh, New York is a lot of crypto. Yeah, right? yeah, no, it's good. Um, um, uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, it's, um, I think, so there's, there's, a, there's an interplay in this world, in, in technology in general, between infrastructure and applications, right? Um, and we don't yet really have, I think, the kind of big killer apps in the crypto space. I, I mean, you could argue Bitcoin maybe, you know, or like is a complete app or something, whereas Ethereum is very much a platform and you build apps. So let me just talk about that Ethereum case, right? So you don't really have like these massive apps used by 100 million people. And so when that happens, which I think it will happen, um, the the infrastructure that supports that will 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 be you know that project will gravitate towards it right so I think I think like right now I, I think it's I, you know I, I think the general belief and I think it's probably fair is that it's it's not over yet um, in a lot of those areas and that specifically around the question of scaling right um, uh, Ethereum has they have a lot of really interesting stuff going on um, uh, that they're doing to improve scaling and. Um, and the plasma the, thing. You're there's plasma, plasma. There's uh, sharding. You know, yeah. proof, proof of stake. Yeah. Wasm. Like uh, uh, there's all this layer two stuff. Yep. Uh, so it's like state channels. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of what we call like sort of side networks, like uh, you know, Truebit and a whole bunch. You know, so a whole bunch of stuff going on. And there's just so many smart people working on it that I think a lot of it will get solved. Um, there's also there's interesting architectural questions. Like, do you need to if you make a game, let's just say, you don't need to put the whole thing on, like the, all the logic, only the, only the logic that has to do with like the, for example, the, the NFTs and not fun, like the, the virtual goods has to go on the blockchain. The rest of it could just be run in a server. You know, so there's, there's all these other interesting architectural questions. Um, but it's a great question. I mean, it's a very active area of discussion. It's something I talk, I have lots of conversations every day about scaling and everything else. And um, there's, you know, it's also, it mixes, it's, it's very, one of the reasons this world's so interesting is like, the, you know, it's there's all these very different philosophies. Like you mentioned, uh, EOS, like they have this delegated proof of stake, which is a whole kind of different. It's almost like a different political philosophy, right? And people are feel very strongly on either side of that. Um, so uh, it's it, it's yeah, no, it's it's a it's a good question. It's endlessly interesting. But I'm glad there's so many enthusiasts here. Yeah. I want one last one. Somebody that hasn't asked a question. Maybe this last question of the evening, and then we'll eat pizza. So this talk has been very optimistic uh, about kind of future prospects, and I'm curious if there's a certain standard that didn't protect the house built on sand that is kind of totally garbage pointing in the same category. <laughs> Other than everything we've discussed? I, I... <laughs> I mean, I think there's plenty of, you know, like, there's, uh, I guess, I don't know. I mean, I, like, I just generally think, like, I just generally believe that, that uh, technology improves, you know, human, like, on, on average, obviously, there's, there's bad technologies, and obviously, there's failed technologies, and there's failed companies, and all sorts of other things, right? But I, th I think, on average, um, it, you know, technology improves human well-being, and that, you know, I think that, that, uh, the you know the the inventiveness of entrepreneurs um, is you know will, will you know will always be there and 
I don't know. Like I just, uh, I, I, the idea that that sort of, you know, we had this, uh, you know, that we had computers, you know, sort of the technology industry start in the, you know, whatever you want to say, like the 40s or 50s or whatever, and then it just sort of ended in 2007 with the iPhone and that was it. Like I just don't find that a plausible narrative. Um, I think we're probably like pretty early on in, in it. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, I mean, there's obviously there's there's risks and you know, um, you know there's tons as you anyone who reads the news knows there's tons of controversy. Look, it, it creates all sorts of um, uh, dislo you know job dislo you know people lose jobs. The, the they they you know you need to um, the economy changes with new technology. Uh, uh, all of these questions we're having now about. Um, uh, you know how do media organizations fund themselves in this world, and how you know uh, what should the rules be by which these social networks you know interact with elections and all sorts of you know the, everyone knows about these issues. So like, there's a lot of important stuff to get figured out. Um, so I'm not like I don't think I'm like you know delusionally optimistic about that. I know I think there's a lot of but but I just think generally like you know I, I do think uh, technology is generally positive. I think it's good for this country to have. Um, to have a strong tech sector, I mean, and um, I don't know. So I guess I am. I err on the side of optimistic. Yeah, you can, right. there's plenty of people that are pessimistic. So you can you can yes. uh, you can hear the other side from a lot of other people. You're not going to hear from me. Wonderful, Chris. Thank you so much. Okay, really thank enjoyed. you.